As we saw from the example on using SQL injection to attack a website, there are actually a couple of different places where security policy could have prevented a successful attack. Now, one thing that uh, the security does do right here is um, it prevents connection to the website in an unsecure fashion. So if I go back to here, colon slash slash unsafe login.php you'll notice that I immediately get forwarded to https colon slash slash glassgirder.com. So the system is refusing to allow me to send information to the web server using um, an unsecure connection. And that's important because if I'm sending passwords in clear text as the user's browser will send to the web server, and somebody has the ability to intercept that packet, they can see the password that's being sent. If I'm using a secure connection, HTTPS, and the site is secure and properly certi certified, then that connection is going to be sending encrypted data and will be unavailable to people in the middle of the network connection. So that part we're getting right. Um, another thing that we're getting right is that uh, the web server itself and the database that's running on this machine are behind a firewall. And the only way to actually access and talk to a service on this computer is through port 80 and port 443, the secure and unsecure web server ports. If I try to connect to the database server that's running on this machine directly from the internet, it's not going to work. Um, inside my local area net, I can connect to it, but outside of my local area net from outside of my firewall, you cannot connect to the database server directly. So that's good. Um, but then things start to break down when you get to the application layer. So the application layer is basically the web server that's talking to the database and the client that's talking to that web server. And uh, first thing that we're not doing um, that's important is we're not sanitizing our inputs. So the reason this fails is because I can enter basically SQL commands or things that are part of SQL commands as input on my web form and they get passed to the database server directly. So I'm just taking strings and I'm gluing them together and passing that information in. And if I were to prevent that, if I were to prevent the user's ability to type in um, parts of SQL commands into that web, uh, web form and then send it to the database as part of a SQL command, then I would effectively block the SQL injection attack. So that's actually fairly easy to do in most programming languages that allow you to talk to a SQL database. There are ways of sanitizing the input and preventing SQL injection on that level. But that's not the only thing that you can do to make your database server safer. And there's always the possibility that somebody will forget to sanitize their input when they're working on an application and will send a bad command to the database server. So we don't want to stop there. In fact, we want to hold off on fixing our inputs until the last thing we do so that we have an opportunity to fix the problem at a deeper layer. And the deeper layer that we can fix the problem at is actually on the database server itself. So the thing I want to draw your attention to is that here's a search box where I can enter a search request. And instead of entering a search request, I'm actually going to enter a command that, uh, oh, let's say, yeah, um, update users set role equal admin where username equals mark, dash, dash. So here's a command that alters contents in the users table and updates the value of a field. And here's the question to ask. Why on God's green earth 
would somebody who's searching for movies need access to the users table? And why would somebody who's just retrieving data from the database need to be able to update the value of a column anyhow? So there's two questions. So the basic bottom line here is that all you need in terms of permission to be able to search through and retrieve matching movie titles is the ability to look in those tables in IMDB that have that information to select that information and to display it. You don't need update permission to do this search and you certainly don't need update information or even access to the users table once you're logged in. So the second or third, I guess, the third thing you can do to make this thing more secure is to restrict the, per the permissions that a particular user or role has um, to only the permissions that are necessary to execute the function. So when I'm back here on the uh, login page, when I'm logging in, I don't need to actually update any information. I don't need to add rows to the users table and I don't need to alter information in the users table. I only need to be able to select on the users table. And I really don't need any other access than that. When I'm filling out a registration form, I need to be able to add a row to the users table. I don't need to be able to alter information in the users table. And I don't even need to be able to select information on the users table. So this one really only requires select in order to match the information that's supplied to the information that's already in the users table. This one only needs to be able to insert. It doesn't need to be able to check what's already there. Maybe I want to check what's already there to prevent the possibility of a user um, accidentally creating an account with the same username. But after I've made, after I've verified that the person doesn't exist yet, at that point, I only need to be able to insert a row. I don't need to be able to do a select and I don't even need access to the IMDB tables. And then once I'm inside and I'm executing my search function, here in the search box, I only need to be able to select information from the IMDB tables and I don't need to even be able to select information from the users tables. So starting from the inner core of functionality working out, I can create separate roles, separate user logins, and separate permit collections of permissions that will restrict the functionality that's available for each of those functions to only what's actually needed to, to, to finish that function. After that's fixed, then and only then should I actually move out a layer and worry about, well, why is the application sending bogus SQL queries to the database server in the first place? And then when that's fixed, if necessary, move out to, well, is the network actually preventing access um, that could be prevented?